Moving yeah, along, we, got the we have a, a very special guest on stage. This is Tina Sharkey. Um, she will be speaking on the future of consumerism. Fun fact about Tina Sharkey, she is my aunt. So we and got the by future blood, by, by blood. blood. Yes, the future is family focused right now. <laughs> um, so Tina, great yes. to meet you. Yes, that's Aunt Tina to you. Aunt Tina. Um, now you recently launched or, uh, a new company called Brandless, or mm -hmm. the idea of it. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Well, um, if you weren't my nephew, I wouldn't be talking on this subject yet because we're not actually out talking, but you uh, convinced me. Um, basically, we're trying to reinvent modern consumption. We don't think it makes sense. Um, we think that we can create an entirely new approach to commerce, to products, to services that bake value in terms of price and accessibility and values. like who are people and what do they really want into everything that we do. So we'll be the purveyors of fairly priced everything. Wow. So why is now the right time for a business like this? Uh, it's a good question. I think that, look, we just came off of a crazy election. And every day, if you didn't turn your notifications off for post-notification stress syndrome, which I definitely have since the election, um, the establishment is done. And so from the ashes of what we used to know as the establishment, whether it's government or products or services or media, rises a completely new and fresh approach. And like when I looked at Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, I actually saw the same thing, which was anti-establishment. Like it doesn't matter what side those, those people were coming from, it was, it was a reaction to, I don't want my parents' government, I don't want my parents' products, I don't want my parents' services, and I definitely don't want to consume media the way the generation did before. So now the ground is very fertile for something that speaks to the people, for the people, by the people, um, that's authentic and anchored in value, but also values, like who am I, not who do you want me to be. So would you say, in, in terms of values, what do you think the highest values are for this new generation of consumers? Is it price? Availability, social consciousness, what do you see there? Check, check, check. All three. Yeah, I would say that firstly, price really matters. Um, and that, but it's also about the authenticity of um, a brand, a business, sourcing, um, and the transparency into what's in it, how is it made, where was it sourced, and what's that story about it. So that story uh, is no longer about what Madison Avenue produces but actually about the authentic origin story. That's often told not by the company, but by the users um, who actually want to share their own stories. So how are CBG companies changing their storytelling approach and marketing approach to reach these new consumers? Uh, they're buying a lot of these companies. <laughs> they're having to reimagine everything because, I mean, really, CPG companies at mass were born in the era of the soap opera. It was funny, the other day I said to somebody, well, you know that like the soap opera was paid for by CPG, that's why it was called a soap opera. They're like, oh my God, I never made that connection. I was like, really? Did you know that toddler meant toddle? <laughs> so essentially, Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark and every major CPG company in America, like soap operas and mass media were how they got built. And that's how stories got told. And that was the aspirational lifestyle that everybody wanted. Well, those things aren't on television anymore. And even if they were, nobody's watching them. And so they have to build an entirely new toolkit. Because the problem with the mass industrial core of manufacturers and CPGs, they don't actually have a relationship with consumers. They've never met one. They sell to their customers are stores. So Target, Walgreens, Walmart, Costco, et cetera. And so they need to re-intermediate themselves. They need to meet consumers. And they need to meet them where they live. And the challenge is they can't reach them anymore because they're mass media, mass buys. You know, short of live events like the Super Bowl, getting an aggregate audience to tune into anything, it just doesn't work like that anymore. People are binge watching television. And the cameras have been turned back on ourselves. So it's really about our story, not their story. So they have to totally retool how they do what they do. And then they're battling with their customers. Because every time they launch a new product, 
Walgreens or CVS or Target launches a private label version of the same thing for $2 less and they put it right on the shelf next to it. So there's like this huge battle going on at retail. The challenge is that the new consumer left the building. So while these guys are rolling down the hill, there's people don't want to go into those stores anymore. So why do you think mass retailers like Walmart and, and whatnot, who offer so many different options um, on the shelf next to each other, haven't caught on to this or haven't changed their ways to realize that consumers are, don't like the approach of having so many options, that they don't need so many options? I think that that's like going to take a, like a, a long cycle to reimagine because they haven't even become digital yet. So when you see Walmart buy something like Jet, which they bought a couple of months ago, that was after they, I mean, Walmart.com was a huge division, but it still couldn't get there fast enough. So these guys are just trying to keep up with Amazon and figuring out how to sell their goods, goods digitally. Um, and before they're going to figure out that those goods aren't necessarily the goods that people want, first they have to figure out how to retool to just go direct to consumer and to go digital. So where do you see e-commerce playing in the future of large consumer product goods and these mass retailers? Are we moving towards a strictly e-commerce world? No, I don't think so. I think that we're moving much more towards a showroom world and an on-demand world than a just-in-time world. So I think that the retailers who are doing omni-channel, and so you can buy it online, pick it up in the store, or see it in the store, but have it shipped online, and like looking at that omni-channel relationship, I think that's going to be very, very important. And the retailers are what we call totally vertically integrated. Those are the ones that are probably going to do a better job. And I think that the way people shop, like up and down the aisles, I think that's going to change. I think people are going to shop much more. It's almost like the Instagrams of the world have created these vignettes. So like, I want that, that lifestyle. So rather than going up and down the aisles, people are going to want the things that they're seeing. And you're going to start to see retailers shifting to more of a showroom-like experience because people are interested in experiences. They're less ex interested in stuff. Right. So, so speaking of stuff, um, there is the, the trend towards materialism as a whole. Um, do you think that materialism is keeping up with the Joneses of America right now? And what's going on in that sense as a materialist society versus brands not playing towards that? Yeah, I think there's a flight to quality and a flight to less. I think there's been, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the joy of everyday things, this minimalism, um, Muji, um, like there's so many things. Like fast fashion sort of exploded over the last decade. Um, but I actually think that people are moving towards less, um, better quality, longer lasting, um, and not wanting the, the weight of just having so much stuff. Because if people want to move towards experiences, they want to be mobile very quickly, and they want to move towards not... McMansions and cars, but Uber and Airbnb and festivals on the weekends. Like it's just a very different lifestyle approach. So as CEO of a, of a new company, how are you taking all this into account to approach your brand strategy and, and meeting the customer and the consumer at their level? I would say that, you know, when we say that we're consumerists, what we really mean by that is, you know, we're activists, we're philanthropists, we're like, we are advocates for the idea that consumers are people and we don't want to be targeted and we don't want to be like cohorted and segmented. We just want to be talked to like people. And so first and foremost, we're putting people first. And we believe that we can build a for-profit company that is steeped in purpose, that takes value, like, you know, accessible price and great stuff, organic, better for you, et cetera, and values, like who am I? And what do I want to do? And where do I am going to derive meaning in my life? And it's not going to be from this package, which is stock up and save, 100 calories, better for you, quick, quick, message, message, message. It's like, whoa, stop. Like, what matters? And like, give me some white space so I can just like go back out and engage in the world so I can act um, and do and be present in my life, in my neighborhoods, in my community. And so we're building a company that's totally built that way from the from the first go so beyond your what are 
What are some of the trends then that you see in consumerism right now? Where is that going in terms of the future of consumerism and beyond your company? Are there any other brands that you think are doing a great job of adapting to those trends? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I would say that one of the major trends, um, and you're seeing it with the Dollar Shave Club, you're seeing it with Casper, you're seeing it with Allbirds, you're seeing it with a lot of these new direct-to-consumer brands is they are skipping channel and they're going direct because they don't want to have to pay the markups um, and they don't want to have to pay the institutions to slot them into a system that's not working. And so this idea of disrupting industry by industry by industry, whether it's the mattress industry um, or whether it's the razor industry, they're saying you, don't, you deserve more and there are certain things that you can just put on a set and forget in the case of Dollar Shave, which is just a subscription uh, razor company, or in the case of Casper, um, and then also tremendous customer service and really a conversation with consumers. So I think that you're going to see that more and more and more. And you're also going to see a flight to much more e-commerce. Not that like I'm here to say as it's any big headline, like, wow, e-commerce is here to stay, like, duh. But there are some laggard categories that are now shifting into commerce, and CPG is one of them. So e-commerce is a, is a very broad sense. What, what do you see as the future? What does purchasing look like in the future beyond e-commerce? Yeah, I would say that people are not necessarily, you know, growing up in America, the, like, in the 50s, you know, the aspiration of, like, the white picket fence and the perfect house and the perfect kids and the perfect garage and all of that, um, and that, you know, the American dream like the American dream is reinventing itself. Right now it's a bit of a nightmare in my opinion, but I believe that as Americans, like we can redefine the terms of engagement. We can redefine what it means to have purpose in our lives and we can do it as individuals um, and we can put purpose and meaning into every single day. We don't have to rely on our institutions to do it. We can take back what it means to have life, liberty and the pursuit of fairly priced everything. Like that's up to us to do, not somebody else. We can't wait anymore for that. So do you think it's um, introducing new products or redefining what selling products is, how you approach marketing those products? Yeah, I would say both. Um, I would say it's new products with purpose. I would say it's new services um, with voice. I would say it's really about kindness. Um, and kindness is not something you sell, it's something you do. And so I think that companies that act with authentic intention, companies that really like care about the people that they're working with and the people that they're serving and that democratization of people and always pe treating people no matter who they are, no matter what they are, like delivering a fair product at a fair price that you've sourced from fair people that have a real story um, and building real relationships um, is something that it's time. So in a way, it's hearkening back to like the general store, um, but in a modern delivery on demand. I think that we've talked about you know, behavioral targeting a lot in advertising. So if you're on one site and then you go to Facebook and you see the stuff that you were just looking at, but behavioral merchandising is not something that's really been hacked. But I think that will give people the stuff they want when they want it. Um, as they need it, as opposed to this stock up and save, I need a Costco closet and I need to like, you know, over consume. I said there's definitely a, a movement towards less, a movement towards fresh, a movement towards quality, and the table stakes for organics and better for you are just like, you know, you can't even show up unless you do that. The key is here in the bubble of San Francisco, like we take that stuff for granted. There's a huge food desert in this country and very few people have the kind of access to goods and services that we have. So it's time to open up that access. It's time to bridge the gap because everybody deserves better. Um, and so let's just start treating people like people and doing what's fair. I can get down with that. Sounds amazing. Um, now, speaking in terms of reaching consumers, uh, we talked earlier today about data and, and how you use that to kind of to form the perfect marketing approach. Um, and is there any, do you see any pushback of people feeling like they are you, having their data taken advantage of to, to see them almost in a, I don't want to use the word creepy, but it's like this is exactly who you are and we know where you are and we're going to give you what you want. 
Um, I think when it works and people like that behavioral merchandising idea, like if you are using, let's say, an Uber platform to get your goods and they know you, uh, the thing that's awesome about data is it works both ways. So the fact that an Uber or a Lyft driver like can rate you and you can rate them, like it's democratized the relationship because you know, one of the games that we play sometimes, and I don't know if you guys have ever done it, it'd be a fun thing to have you do for yourselves right now. Like, do you know what your Uber rating is? Do you know what your Uber score is? 4.8. <laughs> so it's like, how good a customer are you? Um, and, you know, you can open up Uber and I can show you how to get there, but um, all of a sudden we're rating ourselves. So I think that data can be used for good in the sense of like, am I treating people the way I want to be treated? Because like, it's democratized because I'm getting rated as well. And so I think that if you think about behavioral merchandising, targeting for just in time, and knowing that it's like that relationship is both is, has a, a balance, uh, keeps people in check. So in our, to, to close out, because um, this is a talk on the future of consumerism, if you were to sum it up, um, what would you say the future of consumerism is? I would say, in summary, the future of consumerism is that Really, what is the future of brands? Like, what was the original definition of a brand? The true definition of a brand is really about trust, because I'm going to trust you because you come from a certain place. So if we're really redefining the terms around trust, and we are redefining consumers around people, then the future is consumerism as a consumerist, is I'm an advocate for people. So I want to drop the whole concept of a consumer um, and just know that like we're all people and it's the democratization of service. The servers and the clients, like we're all the same. So let's just all get along and just all be friends. Um, and I know you're in stealth mode. Is there any hint that you could give us about Brandless and, and the project you're working on? Uh, let's see, what can I tell you? Um, yeah, let's see. What, um, well. I did write a post on Medium that gave a little bit away. Um, and Fortune wrote an article, so I guess I can quote what they said. Uh, and so we're going to launch with a couple hundred products uh, across everyday essentials. Everything is going to be one price. Um, I can't say what that price is, but it'll be very fair. Um, and it's really just the idea that you know value and values stick together. And so hopefully living the brandless life means giving Doug back Doug. Like it's not about me telling you who you are, it's about you saying like who you want to be. Because that's like so much more important than anything I could ever tell you. Except I have given you timeouts from time to time. I haven't done it in a while. But um, it's definitely something that has gone on. Yeah, in I think our we're life. out of time on that one. <laughs> but Tina, thank you so, so much for being here. It's awesome. amazing to share the stage with you. Um, Brandless, coming soon. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.